Hi, welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and co-host is Chris Lucian. And today we have John Fazzaro. Got some exciting topics, you know, ensembling for training. Uh, some things I've never heard of. I'm excited to dive into. So meatloaf industrialism, agile satori versus transformation. Uh, so I'm excited to learn from John here today. Before we jump into those topics, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm a, um, I've been a software developer since... Uh, um, since about the turn of the century. Uh, some days I, I think I almost had the hang of it. Um, I'm trying to spend as much time with people who, who do or, you know, that I perceive do. Um, I'm always looking for a better way to do it and um, looking for a better way to help teams, um, you know, uh, get, get software out there sooner and have a better time doing it because this work is so, it's so human and invigorating, but there's so much, out there that stops it from being that and i'm that's kind of my my professional mission is to like let's scrape off all the you know all the tailorism all the things from the 20th century so we can move ahead and do this do this job the way it can be done awesome awesome yeah i like that word invigorating yeah yeah work can definitely get there and uh yeah well i guess let's uh jump into the first topic uh you know what's your your story with ensembling for training yeah, well, um, you know, there's this it's just something about um, ensemble programming um, is always stuck in my head. I know it's it's been a long time, you know, since, um, you know, since this has it, been a thing. It's not a new idea. Right. Um, but and, and a lot of places, a lot of places that didn't used to try it are allowing it or, you know, trying it. Um, and it, but it still is stuck in my head as a shiny new idea because I think it flies in the face of a lot of um, a lot of notions that were that were put in our heads about what work looks like. You know, you, you keep your head down at your own station. You don't talk to your neighbor. It's like it's like in school when you you know you're not supposed to look at your neighbor's paper. Um, it flies right in the face of that. Yet it's the you know I I think and I think I, you guys think this is the best way to do this kind of work. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. And I'd go as far as to say, you know, like the performance of a team is, is a, it's a product of the speed at which it's people can share an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, maybe in working together in real time synchronously like this is, is the fastest way that ideas travel between people's heads. And that's how work gets done. Nice. Nice. Yeah. The, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, uh, someone I've been mobbing with for quite a while now, he'll use the phrase, uh, oh, let's go cheat off their homework, which means <laughs> let's let's go learn from what they did and, you know, uh, and then use it, right? And, but, you know, it, it's funny because it's kind of like, oh, wait, we shouldn't do that. And when you said, that, <laughs> like, you mm -hmm. know, you grow up in a, you know, a lot of environments where you're not supposed to uh, collaborate in that way. So, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's funny. Yeah, the, the speed of sharing ideas. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that's um, big with knowledge work, which is a, a lot of software development for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, and um, how did how did you discover ensembling, and uh, how have you seen it impact the speed of idea sharing in your experience? Well, I've always I've always kind of been trying to push whatever whatever company I'm with I'm, or people I'm working with. I'm always trying to bring new ideas in um, because I don't know because I get bored easily. <laughs> um, but I, I, I just want to make sure we're not leaving anything on the table, you know, in, in terms of doing a, a job like this. Um, and this idea came in through, um, I used to run something at a, at a company I used to work with. Uh, we called it the Nerd Lunch. And, uh, you know, we would just, you know, pull a, like a talk or something off of YouTube and watch it together while we ate um, and just kind of make that like a weekly thing. And, you know, some weeks people showed up, some weeks they didn't, whatever. Um, but we, uh, Woody Zool was definitely a, a featured, uh, person in this, you know, he was kind of in heavy rotation. Um, and the mob programming idea went on the screen one week and they were all like, how, how could we do that? That's so slow. <laughs> you know, all the normal reactions to mob programming, but, um, and it, you know, I'm sitting there, you know, eating my lunch going, oh, we got to try this. How am I going to, how am I going to get permission to try this? Um, but yeah, that's, and, and so I've been, you know, at varying degrees, uh, asking permission and, uh, asking forgiveness for mob programming after the fact, it's like, Hey, come here, let's do this thing and not call it mob programming. 
So um, what do you do as far as uh, a training? Like, so so you're saying it uh, as a training medium uh, in this? Yeah, case. yeah. So you like, guys, yeah, you yeah, prompted me with the, the thing I, I put on there and I didn't yeah. even touch on it. Um, <laughs> so in, 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 sort of, I think, uh, stemming out of things like the Nerd Lunch, I said, what if we could just work like this? Yeah. So, you know, it kind of naturally became we're all working together. And then, you know, the... Uh, uh, there were enough new ideas in the room, I think, that we started to want to formalize that that effort of, of you know, spreading ideas and taking new people into the, into the company and putting them right into an environment like that. Um, and I was so I was I was tasked at, at this at this company to run an academy uh, where we took in um, at first it was, you know, just like interns, people fresh out of college getting into software development, but eventually it was everybody in the company that came on board would go through this academy. Um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a teacher in front of a classroom, yeah. traditionally speaking. Um, I didn't want, I did just didn't want that focus on me, um, but I knew where to get lots of information and how to share it with people. And it's just sort of naturally mob programming fit as the way to both share that information and practice together. I like to pair mobbing in an instructional environment. Um, I like to pair it with a concept. Uh, have you guys heard of flipping the classroom? Uh, teaching from the back of the room, maybe? Is that a little like teaching yeah. from the back of the room? But the, the, the general notion is, um, you know, in a traditional classroom, the teacher knows everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have the material and they are lecturing they are announcing the material in a one-dimensional sort of stream to the kids who are sitting at the desks in rows and facing front um set up just like a factory right um, <laughs> with a with a manager or a director you know you, you do this you do that anyway so um a one-dimensional kind of stream of information coming out of this one person's head um and flipping the classroom sort of says well why don't we take that part and put it to make that the homework like you go watch a video or read a book or read a chapter or something like that. And then, and then you come back and the time that we have together in the classroom is now that's sacred interaction time. It's not for one person to speak, but for all people to like do, do something that's a lot more like mobbing where we're interacting. Everybody's kind of on an equal footing. People get to ask the real interesting questions, not just go over the basics. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would, you know, I put together these lessons where it was like, go watch this, you know, this video or go do this tutorial and then come back to me and teach it back to me mm -hmm. or teach it back to the mob. Um, and then, and then, so we created a kind of a, a strong learning environment that way. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, so was each person responsible for a different topic and you assim assimilated it later or was everybody learning the same topic and then working on something together? Like, what did that look like? similar it wasn't perfectly in sync i sort of we uh, we were using scrum actually and after a while we you know we have a, maybe a group of four or five folks at once um and we'd use scrum to kind of organize a focus we'd set up a sprint goals like hey we're mm -hmm. gonna we're gonna learn about web application development um mm -hmm. in this sprint and there would be some lessons in you know that they would they would choose from a kind of a curriculum um, that would be related to web development. They might go in, you know, like a, a more front end, like a JavaScript heavy direction, or they want to learn more about the back end development. And it, I kind of left that open to them. And so some people would have some, they, it was all around a theme, right? But some people would have different lessons on their plate that they, that they took on. And they would, you know, there would be pairing and mobbing even outside of coming back to review the lessons with me. I didn't need to be there. That's but. so cool. And that's such like a novel thing uh, that comes to mind for me is, and I've seen it happen sometimes. There's like some vague memories. And actually I'm part of a, a university class where uh, the professor basically did that was like, oh, I, uh, each people, we're going to read different parts of the book and then come back and you'll teach it to the class when you return, you know? Um, and uh that's like a, it's, it's funny because you kind of see that happen with a mob naturally. Like if you're working on real work, yeah. right. Is, is you're working on a problem. Someone's like, Oh, in my learning time, I learned about this and let me teach it to you all. And maybe we can use it here. Um, but in an academy type setting, I could see how 
um, that would make a lot of sense, right? Because then uh, <laughs> you can see some natural incentives there, right? <laughs> You're going to be in front of your team, your ensemble, yeah. your mob, right? And you don't want to yeah. be like, uh, 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 you know, you want to come prepared. So there's going to be some uh, probably positive social pressure to uh, not do nothing. Um, yeah. 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 It's funny that you mentioned that. I, now I, it's, it's coming back to me that I did design. I like, I use that specifically, like you're going to be in front of people that that's, and that's basically your incentive. Cause I never would, there, there wasn't any kind of grading system. I did, that was another thing I never wanted to do. I never wanted to grade anybody. That's no. awful. Right. <laughs> but if I, if I just create a natural an environment where they naturally are motivated to like know their stuff. Ah, oh, that's cool. And how would it, how would they, I could see, um, like you said, flip the classroom, right? So then yeah. each student takes turns giving a lecture. Was it like that? Or was it like each student takes turns navigating it in, in a mob or something like that? Like how, how did it practically happen? In the it was a little closer to the second one than the first. Okay. I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let anybody like get up there and like start PowerPointing or anything. Mm. That would, that would just be the, the, the flips awful classroom um, <laughs> the wrong it's just, just the wrong correction um but yeah it would it would be uh, there were kind of generally a couple of questions that i would put into each lesson like that you should and it would kind of give them a starting point um like you know explain this concept or you know do this and in, invariably that would lead to a richer discussion that i couldn't have possibly planned because uh... taking into account you know not only even if this person is fresh out of college, you know, versus having done it for 15 years already, everybody brought their own spin on things and would add their own, hey, I know this about this too. And they would make these connections or somebody listening to somebody else, you know, answering the questions would, would bring in a connection. So, you know, the information is coming from all sides. Um, and that was a much richer environment, I think. But just straight, you know, you're, I'm going to put you on the chair and grill you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost more like lead a discussion or an activity versus lecture the rest of the, the students. Okay. That, yeah. that's and really I think, cool. I think there's a lot of things in, in traditional education that do, you know, sometimes they happen upon that, like, you know, read this chapter for homework and then come in and, and we're going to have a discussion. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, like, because there's, there's grading and still like the, the same physical arrangement of all the chairs facing front. I don't know what it is. Um, you know, sometimes it goes well, but sometimes that, you know, the students don't really catch on to the, the collaborative vibe that the teacher is trying to create. That's super cool. That's super cool. I really like that. And it reminds me of like a learning in rows versus learning in circles kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, nice. Nice. Well, if you're good to transition topics, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. by uh, what meatloaf industrialism is. Is this, <laughs> is this a new metal band or what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it should be. It should be, but it's not. Um, yeah. Meat, so meatloaf is a reference to the, um, uh, I'm sure you've heard the, the urban legend where the, um, the mom and daughter are like making a meatloaf and they have to chop the ends off before they put it into the oven. It's an old family recipe. Have you heard this one before? No. Okay. All right. Here we go. I'll do the quick version. Uh, so a mother and daughter are making a, a meatloaf together for dinner. It's a, it's a generations old family recipe. Um, and, you know, at one point, it, you know, they have to, part of the recipe is they have to chop like the last inch or half inch off the each end of the meatloaf before they put it in the pan. And the, the daughter's a, you know, smart, smart cookie. She's a, inquisitive young lady and she says mom do, why do we have to chop the ends off the meatloaf and the mother like kind of she's caught by surprise by this question she hadn't thought about it and she's like you know i don't know it's the way my mother did it and so you know they uh next time they're hanging out with grandma um the mom asks hey why 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 do we cut the ends off of the meatloaf in that in that old family recipe and she is in the same boat she's she just you know, that's the way my mother did it with me. And I don't know, uh, we just, that's the recipe. Um, and uh, luckily great grandma is still alive. She's living in a, near, a nearby nursing home. Um, so the next time they visit her um, and she's, she's just kind of, you know, she's very still, she's very old. She's not, at a, you know, not at all well, um, staring out the window and they just kind of bring up the topic. Hey, great grandma, we're, we were making the meatloaf and we wondered 
why do we chop the ends off of the meatloaf? And she comes to life. Like this the old lady, you know, like some dust flies off her and she's cackling with laughter. She's laughing at them and she says, I don't know why you cut the ends off of the meatloaf. I cut the ends off of the meatloaf because I didn't have a big enough pan. <laughs> and so, of course, it's a, you know, it's an allegory for like doing stuff because that's the way we've always done it. We're not really rethinking our current situation. Um, but meatloaf industrialism, industrialism is kind of a synonym for me for, for Taylorism or uh, actually there's actually a Fordism um, that's separate from Taylorism. I learned this the other day, but um, <laughs> in any case, thinking like a, you know, like, like you're running a 20th century factory. Um, and this, I, I mentioned it earlier briefly, but I think this, this notion of this is what work looks like um, where we have one person standing in the front of a room, you know, and commanding other pe rows of other people who have their eyes on their own paper, much like the way a traditional classroom is designed. I think that is a, a plague on the world of, of knowledge work and software specifically, because as a, you know, um, mm -hmm. I've managed to get into the, the world of agile coaching and, and transformation and, and things like that and trying to get teams who are taught to work in that factory style to you no know, try this other thing. And, um, and what I find is that it's just, just so much meatloaf industrialism. Does that, does that help with yeah, the term? Yeah. So, so going, <laughs> looking back, it's like, oh, that, that's the way we were taught. That's the way we always did it. That's, you know, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think, I think Jason Kearney at one point had told, uh, uh when, when he was working with us had said something along the lines of, um, you know, we were kind of one of the only places mob programming at the time, but he was saying like, oh, this is where developers come to heal. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it's a, a kind of a funny, a funny thing, but yeah, it, it's, it's either, you know, I think sometimes it's just kind of beat into people really, um, working that way, or that was kind of the only way that they were taught. Uh, I think in my university textbooks, agile was two paragraphs at the end of the book that we covered for less than, less than one class session. Um, in the textbook. Sort of yeah. In the te <laughs> yeah. In the textbook, <laughs> read the two paragraphs moving on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I totally see that. Um, and it's an interesting, uh, yeah, it's interesting to call it out. And, um, you know, as we continue to work and we don't question the way we work or we don't, we don't inspect and adapt, then where are we left? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it shows up in, in really seemingly innocent ways, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, and I'd say it's, it's less, it's beat into them if they try to do something different, but it's really just, it's just, that's, it's, it's the water in their fish, you know, or we're fish, you know, it, it, we don't notice it because it's always there. Like um, I'm working with a, working with a team right now and, you know, we're trying to get something, I'm, I'm trying to push them uh, uh, to, to like, let's just get something in production. Let's get this into production as fast as possible. Of course, you know, it's a, it's a larger corporation. So all of the forces of the universe are against us in that, you know, you can't get something into production and inside of a, inside of a month, if you want to try that. Um, but there's also, there's also the, uh, the reflexive, well, we're going to need this and we're going to need that. We're going to need a staging environment and a QA environment and a pre-prod environment. And, you know, and all these like layers of like a hat on a hat and like some suspenders and a belt and like a coat and five jackets and making sure nothing Ha gets anywhere near production <laughs> um is it's it's one of those things yeah. you know and those layers built up over years because somebody once pushed something to production and something went poorly and somebody got angry and so we you know every time somebody got angry we added another environment <laughs> yeah i used to say that in a uh i worked in a very uh um regulated environment at one point mm -hmm. and i think by the time i was working in the process um to get anything to production you had to go through like this checklist of like 50 things and i think that's what they did for a while it's just yeah. anything anytime anything went wrong you added to the checklist and every change from this point on forth has to do to get a signature from some person to make sure that this thing doesn't happen again you know or something yeah. Yeah. and uh 
You know, and what was funny, it occurred to me from like a code perspective with the uh, meatloaf industrialism, almost quite literally, is uh, the character limit thing, right? You, if you see names that are really small and tiny, oh, yeah. all these acronyms, that's literally because that's all the space they had. You know, there's a character limit on how much, how big they can name things at that time. Oh, that's funny. And, they had to chop yeah. the ends off the words. Yeah, they, they, chop, yeah they had to chop <laughs> the ends off, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and the growing the layers because of something painful that is that's inspecting and adapting at a you know at a larger level but the the um kind of the tailorist the meatloaf part of it is that that now gets stamped out for every new situation it's not yeah it's not reconsidered you know yes yeah. this is the standard this is by default now yeah 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 what yeah. do you what do you recommend for unwinding that is, is it yeah what you really need to to unwind things, I I try to never work with a team, um, like I never work work with the code before we have like a higher level purpose statement that's not about technology. It's got to be about mm. what's what's our human problem that we're solving. Um, so as long as there's like a a north star like that, a focus that's not about technology then the, I, whenever we feel, you know, kind of that cruft, the, excuse me, that, that cruft, the meatloaf building up around us, we can say, okay, what do we really need to just to solve this problem? Yeah. And then that's the razor that you can use to slice all the other things away. Gotcha. I like it. It's the meatloaf razor. Yeah. Yeah. Meatloaf. <laughs> it's like, it's a, like, a, like, like Occam's razor, but, but for, <laughs> yeah, for yeah, dead yeah, processes. Yeah. Ah. yeah. And, that, and that's one thing um, I love about when uh, new people, maybe they're right out of school or maybe they they come from another team, but it's like when you're a fish swimming in some water mm. and it, you just don't even question the water, right? You're just like, oh, this is, this is what we do. This is what we do. And then someone comes in and you're like, why, why are you swimming in this water? It's like, what? What water? Oh, yeah, the thing we're swimming in, you know? And so <laughs> I love that when... Uh, when you establish the uh, kind of radical candor and psychological safety where they feel free to question kind of like back to your meatloaf story, like, why are we doing this? You know what I mean? And it just doesn't get shut down. It's like, Oh, let's go find out, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. And we've done that exactly with the, your problem before, right. Where we came into a CICD pipeline that had, I don't know, four or five uh, layers of environments before production and we we thread the needle as far as we could go and didn't really find a satisfy, satisfactory answer for our North Star. So we just trimmed it down, you know what I mean, to yeah. less environments, you know. Um, but that that also took autonomy, you know, because we had the ability to do that. Uh, do you ever run into challenges where teams want to do a thing and they can't because uh, uh, corporate constraints, other corporate constraints? Or <laughs> Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, like I, like I said, there's there's lots of forces outside the team. That are you know that that tend to tie people's hands in environments, especially larger ones, because they've done so much of this. You know, you have to do this, and here's the fifty point checklist, and you know, you have to email this person, but they're on vacation, so tough luck. And you know, um, <laughs> yeah, just the the bureaucracy that builds up, and no, you know, no one person is. It's not anybody's fault. It's just this is the way the system has grown, and you know, from you know, just thinking about the. Yeah, the, there's always there's always seemingly an obstacle. Um, more than anything, I've felt on this team and other teams that are trying to do similar things. You try to get something into production inside of a week, and you're going to find out every place um, where the block. You know, you're going to spend most of your time blocked by yeah. things outside the team because it's been built up that way. Like the developers are over here, the testers are here, the ops people are over here. Oh, wait, no, we don't call them the ops people. We call these the DevOps people, but they're over here. And, <laughs> you know, like it's still, you can call it whatever name you want, but you've still got silos. You've still got factory departments that don't connect with each other. And connecting with each other is how you get the work done. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> lots, of, lots of time blocked. Lots of, um, we have to actually write ourselves a rule because the instinct is so strong. When you get blocked, on one thing that, well, oh, there's this other work we could do. We could, uh, you know, document this, or we could make this nicer, or we could build this service because we know we're going to need it. Um, 
And we actually wrote down a rule uh, to keep us from doing this because mm -hmm. that's how things stay blocked. That's, you know, if we want to actually change this organization, change this team and show them how to do something differently, what we have to do when we get blocked is make noise. We have to send emails. We have to, you know, color things red. We have to make that transparent to people outside the team until somebody, we find somebody who can help. Mm, and like and dare, dare I say, you know, sit on our thumbs for a little while while we're waiting <laughs> for an answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Cause ah, there's, there's something very human, at least in my personality is that when you're blocked that you don't want to bother the other people, the other parts yeah. of the system, right? You're like, Oh, I'm going to bother them. I'm going to interrupt them. And I think it's something you say quite a bit, Chris, is that when you have a whole mob blocked, you feel more uh, in, in that, I mean, entitled is maybe the wrong way to put it, but more empowered yeah. <laughs> to make well, yeah. noise because you're like, hey, we have four people blocked right now uh, on getting this done. Uh, you know, uh, is there anything we can do about this? You know, <laughs> or when we walk over, I remember uh, we walk over to another part of the system where they had. Uh, kind of meatloaf industrialism kind of going on and we're in but you walk up as a mob and you're like hey we'd like to get this thing in production but this is in our way and it's interesting how many people are like oh right this way go ahead go ahead go ahead do it you know what i mean they like hand you the keys and you're like okay great you know <laughs> um but making noise when blocked i like that a lot that's mm -hmm. uh yeah um, you run it yeah you really run into your lizard brain doing that because you know you, you like you don't want to draw attention to yourself but I think, I think that's a fair point though. When you have a mob blocked, it's not just about you. So you don't feel like you're making noise about you. You're not being selfish. You're mm. looking out for these people over here who are, who are blocked. And, you know, if you're the person who makes enough noise, you, you know, you're, you're helping them. So it's yeah. maybe that's a little makes makes it a little bit easier if you have that kind of personality. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think like strategically for me in the past, uh, you know, even uh, away from ensembling, um a, a big thing was like oh you know so so you get blocked and maybe you can't do anything about it but rather than working on the next thing uh working on setting up a meeting to make sure that you don't get blocked again <laughs> and so so you know kind of still focused on that same item but in a process improvement mode and i think that's definitely not um kind of the the norm uh and then also, I think another interesting bit is um, drawing attention to uh, to flow dynamics, single piece flow, lean, all that stuff. You, it's like educating people that don't, you know, <laughs> get them to the point of understanding where they realize, like, oh, you know, it's their idea to fix the problem, not yours. Like that's another strategy yeah. that I have. Yeah. That I like, yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, yeah, here's some cool stuff on lean. And it so happens that we have that problem right now, but I'm not going to call it out explicitly. And then, you know, give it a week or so. And they, it's their idea to remove this because it related to that article you sent a week ago. Yeah. Um, that, that's always really good to see. Yeah. yeah and I, li I like that move too, Chris, with kind of coaching up. And, you know, you know, this whole thing made me just have a realization right now. Hmm. It, I think there's many layers to why if you're doing solo development blockages can persist and one of them like it was like you said being selfish feeling empowered but two like the typical corporate culture is if you become a squeaky wheel is that like oh this person you know is incompetent and doesn't know how to get it done and they're complaining you know what I mean like bring me solutions not problems right and yeah. I remember and but you know and so but when it's a whole mob or a whole team right it's kind of it, it's harder to like just eschew that right to <laughs> uh yeah. you know when when this team literally can't do anything about it you know the blockage <laughs> and so yeah. um yeah and, and and yeah I just reflect back on teams are working solo and blockages would persist for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And certain people and the people who just stayed busy and piled up more work in progress, they were seen as awesome rock stars, right? Because yeah. they churned out more, right? 
And the yep. people who made noise were often seen as like, oh, this is this negative compl complaining person, you know? And so. Yeah. Um, yeah. The environment really teaches us to like, it's, you know, it's back to valuing busyness over getting things done, you yeah. know, started over getting things done. And when you have an organization that's laid out, you know, so you're blocked at every turn, every time you actually want to connect something. Yeah. yeah. You're, it's the path of least resistance. That's the phrase I'm looking for. Path of least resistance is to just grab the next task and start something new. Yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> this might be a good time to transition to uh, agile Satori versus transformation. What are you thinking here? Oh, well, Satori is a, it's a concept from Zen mm. uh, and without getting too, I don't want to get too, like Buddhist nerdy, but um, the the essential difference between, at least on the topic of enlightenment, between Zen and Buddhism, is is that uh, in Buddhism there's there's sort of stages. There's a gradual path um, that you that you travel, and then you know at some point you become enlightened uh, if you've traveled far enough. And in Zen. Uh, there's this notion of satori. It's a, it's a sudden enlightenment, awakening, and it's a thing that you know you may chip away at it a lot. You may work at it uh, or focus on it or not at all in Zen. Uh, maybe somebody just hits you with a stick and you become enlightened. You know, um, and I've come to I'm, I'm looking at the whole problem of quote unquote agile transformation, and I think this is a, this is a a fraught topic. Um, I see you guys nodding already, but, um, but I, I wonder, I, I've, I've got a little bit of evidence that I can see um, in people, you know, people around me, some things that have been done a little differently, that uh, agility is really more of a Zen thing um, in terms of awakening to it, in terms of the transformation that actually happens. You, you might, you know, maybe go through the motions of test-driven development and become irritated all the time. But then at one point, the bit flips and you're like, oh, you know, like it, it's because it's a different way of looking at work than like, for example, all the layers of meatloaf industrialism. There is a way that you can just sort of shift your view, I think, and all that stuff suddenly looks like meatloaf industrialism instead of this is what work looks like. Mm -hmm. um, one example, one a uh, little more tangible example of this is um, is a, a thing where the, I don't know what, even what to call this pattern yet, but um, I've seen more success in let's say we have a, a team that's working in a in a fully agile way. They're not on the path. They are. This is an agile software development team mobbing, test-driven development, CICD, all of the bells and whistles, everything you need. They get stuff, you know, shipped in minutes. I don't know, <laughs> super agile team. Um, it's more effective for somebody, if you want to transform somebody who's not thinking that way, bring that person and maybe one other into that team, submerge or immerse them, that's the word, immerse them in that environment so they can see everything working together they become flipped much faster than if you took one or two people from the agile team and put them in place as coaches while these, you know, in a non, in a more traditional team, yeah. um, try to, and try to be on the sidelines and go, Hey guys, can we try GDB? Hey guys, let's try this. You know, <laughs> that's the, the, I guess let's call it the, Hey guys, uh, model of agile coaching. Hey, yeah. that's exactly how I sounded. How did you know how did you know I sounded <laughs> when I did that many years ago? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and and I think uh, we even see that. So you know, we do uh, often have you know visitors from other companies kind of see our environment, and and then it's unfortunate because they they uh, they almost end up in that position going back to their company, like you know, so they're like, hey, we saw this at this other company. Yeah. Um, and then, and then other, uh, we've had a couple of people, you know, gradually send like half their development team to, to come visit. Um, but, uh, you know, it, uh, I, I totally agree. So I think that taking something that's working well with people that want to try it and then growing it gradually, rather than trying to get everybody to convert right away or something like that, um, 
uh, and, and grow it through visitation almost, or like exposure, uh, um, has, I, I think has been very successful, uh, um, in different scenarios that I've seen. And I also, I also see you get tons and tons of re- resistance when it's not just an invitation to come see what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I totally, you know, I, I, I'm right there with you on that. Um, like going to watch an action movie versus do you want to get robbed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's way less threatening. Yeah. 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 And, and I think Chris, uh, the, the part of the journey for the early mob programming movement was people being immersed in agile conferences, right? Like that yeah. was part of the, and, and it, it reminds me of, like if you studied uh, the history of ideas, the history of science and things like that, it is almost like a paradox because it is slow, gradual change, like over time, but then there's these like punctuated paradigm shifts, you know what I mean? Where it's like, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden in a very short time, everyone thinks this is dumb and this is good, where 10 years before they would have thought that about something else, right? Yeah. And you know, the slow, gradual stuff was happening maybe in the background or latently in like, you know, high up academic circles or in this grassroots movement over here. Um, but the major cultural shift is very sudden often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And- yeah. So slowly and then all at once. And and the all at once wouldn't have happened without the slowly either. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I guess... <laughs> We could just do TDD zaps, right? You know, you just like throw them in a room and then zap them for, you know, five minutes at a time. And then maybe they'll, maybe all of a sudden they'll transform. Uh, But yeah, so I mean, I guess kind of with that realization, how does that impact your day-to-day coaching or development or, you know, uh, yeah. I think as much as, um, as much as I have a say in it anymore, um, if I'm if I'm working with uh, working with a client or you know a sponsor and they want me to work with a team, um, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to maybe talk to them about getting like the most advanced team that they have or the most advanced in an agile sense um, or the most yeah I guess the most agile folks they are, have together. Let's get those people concentrated in one place mm. um, and let's and let's. Uh, you know, even maybe there's some people on the periphery who want to learn agility, but haven't yet. Um, and we say, no, not yet. We keep them on the outside and sort of create some, you know, a concentrated agility in the organization, a visibility of that, you know, so that other people can see what's going on. And also like a kind of a, a velvet rope, um, you know, let's, let's keep it, keep it concentrated create some scarcity, right? It almost sounds mean and exclusive, but I, I think if you create a, a scarcity like that around there, it's kind of we're stealing something from, stealing an idea from marketing. Um, like this is the exclusive club, you know, to, to make it uh, more interesting. And then that tension, I think, that we create um, in the organization can maybe move it forward in a, in a more effective way than, um, hey, we've got this nine point framework that we're going to install now and send a bunch of you guys to certification training. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's hard. Uh, you know, it, those big releases, you know, I, I always hear more about more pain than than good out of out of those things. And maybe maybe it's just that, uh, you know, maybe there's like a opposite of a survivor bias, like the, the people that are successful with it are just really quiet because they were successful and just moved on. But I don't <laughs> think that like, that's the case. Uh-huh um but uh yeah so um yeah there 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 is there is that you know we will come visit us go you know and also it's almost like the law of personal mobility or the law of two feet from like open space conferences this idea that like you know hey you can work that way or you can work this way over here and and then um and then just like talk about uh, successes and problems solved and things like that. And and that can be really helpful as well. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think so much about a team's like Dora metrics 
are, is invisible right to, to the rest of the world and and people don't even know like the fact that releasing to production is an important aspect of software development. <laughs> like, you know, I think that that's- Taken away from them for so long. Yeah, exactly. their job. Yeah. That's the job of the DevOps team. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's really funny to, to have a conversation of like, hey, the, the, like this is a primary measure of success. And, and it's like, oh, you know, this team is doing that this often. And, and a lot of the time, like when we when we say something like, "Hey, we can release in like the same couple hours that, that the code's written," uh, you know, we'll have a lot of people come visit that are their minds are blown. Like, you know, how how is that remotely possible? Uh, <laughs> and yeah. Whereas if you were just describing it to them, yeah, um, they'd talk about reality. Yeah, too. yeah. Well, oh, man, yeah. roll their people. eyes or whatever. Yeah, and so, but you 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 know, so so I like this idea of having like overwhelming data during the conversation. Like, oh yeah, you know. Uh, we we've been releasing you know 16 times a day for the the team here and then you know and that, that's been going on for the last 10 years it's like you know like the, that, that whole thing of like oh well that really can't work it's like okay well it's been going for 10 years now or something like that that's that that conversation you can kind of see like wheels start turning for the you know uh in earnest for the first time so yeah yeah I got one more question for you before uh, I know we're getting close on time, Chris, but it's something I've been struggling with and it, for myself. And then also um, when coaching others um, and it, it, returning to that, uh, Hey guys, let's try this, you know, kind of a style. And when I find myself on a team like that, or, I'm, um, you know uh, you know, we're coaching each other. I'm coaching someone who finds themselves in that situation there's this part of me that feels guilty for leaving and starting new, like almost like, Hey, I see this team doesn't want to operate with radical candor. Should I just stay and keep doing the Hey guys thing and try to win over a couple people? Or do I just start and form something new where it's just like you said, immersion in that style. Um, and I, I always struggle with like, am I not being gritty by, you know, kind of gutting it out and trying to help this team, yeah. you know, I guess when, when to stay in, you know, show people a possible other way or when to form a new kind of like law of two feet, like you're talking about, Chris. Um, I don't know. Do you have any advice there? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, man, I wish I did. So <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, it, it does, it reminds me of like, um, I think Seth Godin has a whole book about, uh, he's called, he calls it the dip. Mm. And I think a lot of, a, a lot of it, it's the basic concept is like, when do you stick through the dip? Like when things are terrible, uh, if you you know do you know the the um, Virginia Satir's change curve, kind of oh, looks yeah. like a saxophone. Like it goes, you know, yeah. it's like status quo, and then you go into hell for a while, but then you come out better. Yeah. Um, so the dip is it's kind of the same idea, um, roughly. And if like the the question is how how do you stick through the dip, and like what's the calculus for is quitting actually the right thing to do here? Like you're saying, I, mean, I think, I think there's any number of better people to ask than me. I think about that. <laughs> but if we, if we think about that as a general problem, not just mm. like an agile coaching or a team's systems problem, but how do, what, how do other domains address this? You know, should I stay or should I go? Mm. Um, I think we, we could probably find some patterns there if we looked at that. And I should probably read the dip. Nice. No, that's nice. Thank you for sharing that reference. That's great. Yeah. It, yeah. it might be another form of grit to continue with a different style. So like, mm. so, yep. so shifting from let's all do it. Hey guys to uh, invitation based, um, you know, and law of two feet based and, and you know, prodding the system because we're in an all in chaotic systems. So like that might be one possible answer. Yeah. Um, but uh, it always kind of, that always kind of works out for me and always is like the last thing I try. Um, yeah. is right <laughs> back to, back to uh, Woody's turn up the good thing. Yeah. You know, um, focusing on the people on your team that are stronger and further ahead than worrying about, you know, the, the sheep that are straying. Um, that takes up a lot of energy and it's very frustrating and, you know, yeah. and not, but if you, if you really focus on the people who are ahead, then 
maybe you create a little bit of that hype, that scarcity that draws the others in. Nice. All right. Well, uh, I think this might be a good time to close it out. Before we do, John, do you want to plug or share anything? Yeah, um, I'm consulting with uh, Industrial Logic these days. Um, and we have uh, uh, something I put together uh, is a, an Android workshop, an industrial Android workshop, where we um, we use uh, the flipped classroom and and mob learning, um, in fact, to uh, to teach how to how to build Android apps um, in a kind of a modern agile way, with uh, you know test driven development, proper architecture, thin slicing, continuous delivery, things like that. Um, awesome. So that's that's uh, one of our one of our offerings that that I stand behind. All righty. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, to our audience, um, if you know somebody who's uh, maybe struggling with uh, training a traditional way, or uh, maybe they just really love their meatloaf, um, <laughs> or uh, someone who is uh, on their path to an agile enlightenment, but haven't quite reached their destination, uh, their Satori, uh, then, you know, please share this episode with them. And um, with that, uh, you know, like and subscribe and, and share uh, comments, you know, tell us if you disagree with anything that you said here, we'd love to chat about it or, uh, or if you, you know, uh, vehemently agree, I think that'd be a fun thing to talk about too. And, uh, thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks guys.